Then, okay. okay. And uh, if I can find my mouse. Oh, still on this side. Ah. Well, on this side. Okay. Okay, and as I mentioned, we can cover some of the more advanced features in CSS. So some of these have been around for a while. For example, CSS selector. And so if you haven't heard that before, the CSS selector is of part of the CSS rules, which specifies which part of the page that formatting will be applied to. Okay, for example, you can see... Uh, <coughs> let me see, do I have a... Okay, this is a simple example. So it's specifying the formatting rules for the H1, so the level 1 heading. So the H1 itself is the selector. And then within the curly bracket, that's the rules you can apply. So it makes color red. That makes the color of the text of the H1 red. Okay, um, so that's probably the simplest one. There's nothing really to talk about that one. Okay. So this is a slightly more complex. Okay, slightly more complex ones. Now we have two things get mentioned. So first is when H1, the second one is EM. So does anyone know what EM stands for? Ah. So EM is one of the elements introducing HTML5, and it makes text italic visually. And so it's done something similar to the effect of I before, that's what existed before, but it's highly recommended not stop using I, which does not have any semantic meanings, where EM stands for an emphasize. And the way to emphasize is make it italic. And you can change the formatting of M. So in this particular, and we'll see a bit more details later on what it means. We have two elements and separated by a space. Okay? The spacing between them is quite important. And you can specify by classes or ID. So you should all know now what classes or ID is, isn't it? Okay, can anyone tell me what's the difference between class and ID? When you should use a class and when you should use an ID? Yeah, do you want to have a go? Yeah? Class when we have multiple elements on the same page and ID for one single element. Yeah. Okay, that's and exactly what it means. So class means you want to assign to more than one element, usually a lot. And for example, I don't know, there's certain paragraphs on the page, you want all the text to be blue. There are maybe three or five of these, and you can assign them to a certain class, and then you can change color to blue, and all these classes will have the same formatting compared to the rest of the paragraphs on the page. So that's class, and for ID it's the opposite, and you want to assign that to only one element on a single page. So it's almost like your ID or your name, you want it to be unique. You don't want to be two things with the same ID on the same page. You can have the same ID on multiple pages, but on the one page you can only have one ID or one view for an element. So, anyone knows what happens if two elements get the same ID on the page? So, if I define one of the ID as, say, Goldie, and you have another one that has the exact the same ID like... Sorry? Okay, so one option, one answer is you'll get a console error. And then probably treats the first ID as a selector. Any... yeah? So, the, okay. So the answer is say you have a console error. If you remember, we have the develop tools in the browser, which you can see all the errors. And also the first one is take priority. Any other? Okay. So I think what happens is actually the second one will override the first one. 
So usually we're only the last one will work if they have exactly the same ID. So if you have three elements has exactly the same ID on the page, and you specify some formatting for that particular ID, which I do do here with a uh, the pound sign, and then only the last one will be applied. The previous two will be overwritten. Okay, and we can also talk a little bit about pseudo elements. So we all know in this here, the selector is A, which is the link, but you can have different status of the link, say, when it is a link, when it's being clicked, or when the link being visited, then you have this pseudo class. And after that, to define different status of the link. Okay, and then we can talk about a little bit more complex, say, for example, in this one. So only when uh, title. So only one say the link has a title or a link has a particular uh, URL, when the format would be like. Okay, so we start with uh, selecting by context. So here, we select an element, say, by its parents, by its neighbors, okay, not just say what the element is. And okay, can you see the text there? Is that big enough? And hands up if anyone say that's too small, they can't really see it. Okay, there it is. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any way I can make it bigger. And um, maybe I just have to explain roughly. So that shows an article element within a page. So the first line is an article. And then you have a heading, H1, and some paragraphs. So that's one paragraph, start with many tourists and lots of other texts afterwards. Second paragraph of the Barcelona, etc. And you have a section. Within the section, you have an H2 paragraph, and then another section starts with H2 and more content. So that gives you a context of the HTML pages, and then we can see why how the selectors are working. Okay, so first you can do something like this. So you can have, say, an architect and P, and the color is red. Okay, so so first question is, when you have this, and um, is this the formatting applied to architect, and um, which is a classroom, sorry, a class name that's defined for this particular article? is defined as architect, or is that uh, formatting for P, or is that for both? Okay, <laughs> yeah? Uh, it's for any instance of P within something that is in the architect class? Sure. Yeah, so, so the answer is, it is applied to P, Okay, so it's not formatting rules for architect. Architect in this context, uh, so in this example, is called the so-called context. So say you want to pick a paragraph that's inside an element which have the class called architect. So if we look at this example, we have this paragraph there that's inside the, arti the article which has a class architect. So that will be applied. Similar for this one. Okay, so the question is here. Does this one applies? So if you can see, this is also a paragraph. It's not directly inside uh, this article elements has a class called artifact, sorry, architect. But it's inside section. So the question is, does that apply? No? Yes? Uh, I didn't quite get the closing tag is the end. Yeah. So everything between articles, uh, I mean, articles and articles, uh, so the paragraph between it, uh, yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to keep that question for now. Ah, actually, you can see the results uh, here. 
So this is actually what we'll see on the page, and you can see actually all the paragraph, so long as they are inside this article, which is top level element, they will be all formatted. So that means doesn't matter whether it's one level inside or two level inside, this rule will apply. <coughs> and uh, similarly, you can have this. Uh, it's very similar to the previous one, except instead of a space between the architect and the P, now you have a greater than sign. Okay, this is very similar. Okay, so the difference this time is it still applies to P only, not to architect. But if only P is one level inside the architect elements, if it's two level or three level inside, this rules will not apply. Okay, so if we look at the page again, we can see this P, which is mandatorist, which here is red. This P is called start with Barcelona, this is red. But for this paragraph here, it's not directly inside article, it's inside a section first and before it's inside article. So that no longer applies. And similarly for this paragraph here. Okay, so that's the difference between a space and a greater than sign. Yeah. Okay. And still again, exact the same example. And uh, we can use this. Okay, so this we have another symbol now, it's plus. And so actually, if you remember, we talked about this emit and in the lab, which you can allow you to type much faster. And the symbols they use follow more or less the same semantics here. So if you have a plus sign, that means these two elements at the same level. Okay, so as described there, so in this particular case, we have a formatting rule, which is my text words, but only applies for one paragraph, sorry, for paragraph elements, which is a sibling to another paragraph. Um, can anyone see which paragraph in this meet that requirement? So we have one paragraph here, another one, there's one here, and presumably some here as well. So which one would meet this requirement? First, any other? Okay, so the answer is the second one. So as usual, so the formatting applied to the second uh, second element mentioned in the conditions. So the second element is a sibling right behind another paragraph. So that's only why this one is applied. Okay. Okay, and this is another way to show the siblings. So instead of plus, you have a tilted sign. Okay, so the tilted sign is a kind of relaxed condition compared to the plus. So it says, in this example, it's applies to H2, not H1. And so long as there's H1 before H2, it will become red. Ah, so we didn't have the... So in this example, and we have this H2 here within the section, and this H2 here within another section. So both these will be red because they have this H1 before them. And this H1 does not have to be immediately before them. Okay, and uh, there's also some other more com ways to select different elements. So you can use this one. You can say apply to the first child. That means the first list items in an 
either unordered or ordered list. So if you look at HTML code here, you have unordered list, you have one, two, three, and four elements. And for this one, it only applies to the first element. So that might be desirable in some cases. And similarly, you can use last child, and then the last one will be formatted. Okay, so it allows you more control. So this is for sometimes where you don't want to old elements or old items have exactly the same formatting. Okay, similarly you can actually do first letter. Okay, this is saying the first letter of a P, a paragraph. You can say the first letter of a heading or first letter of some div element. And you can see only the first letter has the formatting. It's being colored red, it's bigger, and also bold. And similarly, you can have first line, and you have the formatting like this. So the first line of the paragraph is red, and this actually changes uh, dynamically. So you can see when the pages or display become smaller or narrower, the first line becomes shorter, but still only the first line shows as red. Okay, so these are the things. Um, the which we just saw, like the first line or first letter, and it's called pseudo elements. In the sense, you almost formatting them as an element, but it's not a real HTML element. So that's what is called a pseudo element. Does that make sense? So this is just allows you to give you extra flexibility when you're selecting which element you want to do the formatting. <coughs> Okay, um, I'm gonna maybe. Okay, this is another example of pseudo element, and which is uh, selecting the or selective formatting of the um, anchor elements, the links based on the states. So we already saw an uh, early uh, sorry, example early on, and uh, so for the A, which is the link, you can have different status. And uh, the one, the link, is a default state. And the second one says visited, so that's the formatting when people click on the link. And usually it's different, it's just to tell the user, say, okay, I've visited this page before. And you can have the focus status. Does anyone know what is the focus status of an HTML element? Now, if you move mouse over and it will be hover state, which is a different one than the focus. Uh, now we have active below. So the active is something when you click it. It's at the okay. So the active is a state when the mouse being clicked down on the particular link, and that's the time the link being activated as active. And the focus actually means, um, so this happens when you're trying to navigate a page without a mouse, and you can actually press your tab key, and there will a focus moving between the elements on your page. Did anyone of you see that before? So for example, if I open the page, most simple one, which is a Google, let me see if we can Tab. Can you see there is the, the box moving? So that's the focus. So you can set say if it's a link and if you get to the focus. Uh, where did it go this time? Okay, so I started with a search bar, now the focus is on the Google search button, etc. etc. And that's your focus status. Okay, you can Format the link differently that as well, just to tell people this currently has the focus, and you can have different colors for each of the states as they point here. Okay, 
And so this is done formatting about selecting by attributes. So let me see the example here. Okay. So for example, I'm sorry, the text is a bit small again. So we have two classes, sorry, two paragraphs. The first paragraph has a class called intro. The second paragraph has a class called highlights. And you can use that information to define to define which paragraph will be and formatted. Okay, so for example, if we just say P, this time using square brackets say class, and only the first and the third one get formatted, color red, because these are the paragraphs which has a class. So for this and this, the second and fourth one does not have class. It does not has uh, does not have class, so they get not get formatted. And you can more be more specific even to say I wanted the class to be a specific class. I can say class equal to e intro, then only this one will be highlighted or changed. Okay, so these are the some other options you can use. You can say an attribute equal to a certain value or not equal to is okay sorry this is the exact match or you have space between the expect matches <coughs> okay um, so this is the Another very common one you will see, you probably use that already, is when you specify a group of elements. So, for example, you want a few elements have exactly the same formatting, you need to use comma. So, that just says in this particular example, it says for h1 and h2, they both will be red. So, in this case, it does not say in, um, it's formatting h2, for example, inside h1 or after h1. Okay, that's what the comma means. And you can see both H1 and H2 get formatted red in this case. Okay, and so if you combine all these different examples or rules we talked about earlier, it can get quite complex. Okay, can anyone have a guess what this one trying to do? Okay, we saw most of these before, so we saw, okay, this is something to do with a class, because it has a dot. The class name has to be called project, and you have a space, and if you remember, space means it has to be a children or grandchildren of certain elements, that's space. And you have to have H2, and this is a condition, so for the H2, the language has to equal to ES, which is Spanish, I assume. And you have the plus sign. If you remember, plus sign that means a sibling. <coughs> so that means the element behind has to be sibling of this, right after this one. And finally, you have space again. That means this EM has to be inside this paragraph. Okay, so basically, this formatting is apply to this EM only and all these things before it are the conditions to say which EM this would be. Okay, it's get the, the basic rules are the simple things I've mentioned before. Okay, so first it has to be found within a paragraph if you're going backwards. Or that P paragraph must be adjacent to an H2 elements. That's what the plus here means. And has a language attributes value begins with ES. So that's what this part means. And it has to be inside element, which is class name being project, which is this part. Okay, so 
And this example really, I mean, practically, you're probably not going to do this. If you want to format these very complex rules, you might just want to, say, give this particular element an ID and format it a specific way. This is just an example, really, example to show you how complex it can get to when you combine these different selected rules. Uh, okay, so we might not have time to go through this part as we're going to spend quite a bit of time already. And uh, yeah, there's some new selectors you can have. Okay, now we move on to the second part, and which is about the fonts. Okay, and you all have used font formatting before, most commonly in Microsoft Word. You can say select text and change different fonts. Um, but you can do the same in HTML, and actually font can play a quite big role in terms of the looks or feeling for a web page or web app. And uh, web fonts means because in on the system, and uh, the number of fonts available is quite limited. Um, okay, that's not quite true. And so, say anyone knows how many fonts you have, say on the Windows system? Any guesses? Roughly how many? Seven. Seven, and it's a bit more than that, and depends. So I think uh, probably close to 100. So, so basically, if you remember in Microsoft Word, if you want to change the font of a certain text, and you open up the drop-down list, you can see all the fonts that's available on the system. Right? And, but actually, the fonts available on Windows, for, for example, first, and differs between on the version of the Windows, and then the fonts available on Windows is different from the fonts which is available on Mac. Does that make sense? The, the Mac also has lots of fonts, but say the common one between those two is quite small, and they have other systems, they have different set of fonts. So usually the save fonts that you can use in a web page is about six or seven, so which is quite limited. And also, okay, do you know what happens if the browser cannot find a particular font you specified? So, yeah. So basically, if you spend some fancy font, which looks really nice on your computer, but the, browser, the people visiting your page does not have the font on their computer, the browser would use the default font for that particular browser. So most cases, like Times New Rome, very popular common fonts. So you will lose your design element. So this is where the fo web fonts come in. So what web fonts does is you do not you providing a link to a font file which is somewhere hosted online. So when people open up the page, it will also load that font file so that can be used in a particular page. Does that make sense? So, so, so long as the user have access to the font files, you can make sure, and you can ensure that they will be able to see the particular font you want to use for the page. Okay, so these are the standard ones, and which you can use, which is relatively safe because most of the system will have these, like Arial, Verdana, and Georgia. Okay, but sometimes you want to go something a little bit more and elegant or fancier than that, so like these ones, which, and in many cases, the user will not have installed on their system already. Okay, so in this case, you want to provide them using online web fonts, and there's a few places that you can do this. So Google has its own online web fonts, which allows you to add um, fan more fancier fonts to your web page, there's a different website, and Adobe has its own website as well. Okay, um, we can have a quick look of what looks like, for example, available from Google. <coughs> so these are different fonts that you can Google provides. And there are certainly much more variety, so it can be more options than you can choose and use it safely in your web page because you know that people will be able to use it. 
Okay, and uh, so the first thing is you need to pick a font that you want to use for a page, and then you need to add that to your uh, website, either by adding to the HTML page or the CSS file, depends on how you want to do it. And this is, for example, this is uh, this is using Typekit, but if you see in the screenshot below, these are two particular lines that you need to add to your page to use a particular font. And this is usually provided by the service, the web font service. They will tell you what other code you need to include and where to include them. And so, for example, if you want to use Google Font, that will be the one way to include them. So let's go back to the Google Font page. Okay, let's say I. Okay, let's say I like this one. <coughs> and uh, you can see the more details. Uh, it should be somewhere that tells you what you need to add to your page. Typing directly into the text field. Well, they must have changed it. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, it's done but at the bottom. Okay, so once you select the font, it will tell you what you need to do. For example, <coughs> for the previous font I, uh, I selected, it tells you you need to add this particular line to your page. That's all you need to do. And then when you do the formatting in your CSS, and this is the font family, you have to specify. And sorry, it's a bit small. Can I? So that's all you need to do. And then you, once you add this line to HTML page, or when you use import, that's the line you can put either in the style tag or in your CSS file. And then later on, you can refer to it use this line. So if we go back to our example, so this is very similar. So that's the line of text you need to include in your HTML file. And then, when the page loads, it will go to the Google website, load the font files, and then you can display it on your page. And you can do exactly the same, and, but in CSS file, and in this time, you have to use the import keyword. And it's the import URL, etc., etc., which is, again, it will be provided here by Google. You can just copy-paste that. So it's really quite simple. Okay, and after that, you can just use it as the font, as if it exists on your computer. And you do say font family, and that's the particular one we used in the previous example. You can see that's the font family we just added to or imported. <coughs> okay, and uh, a very quick thing. so. For example, in this family and this is formatting, we said we want this particular font. We just import it, but we also have this sans serif at the end. Does anyone know why we need the sans serif at the end? Again, this one covered in the. Anyone have a guess? No. Okay. So the reason is. And in the CSS, it actually allows you to specify a backup if the previous font does not work for whatever reason. For example, maybe the font is not available on the user's computer, or maybe that particular day, say the Google service, font service is down, so people can't download the file. 
then it would allow you to say a backup. So in case the first option is not available, we can have a second option. And you can have up to three, so you can have a third one as well. And in this particular case, it says send serif. It's actually not one particular font. It's not like a Tory. It's not a one font. It's one category of font, which basically does not have little ticks at the end. So basically any this type of font will be used. Okay. Uh, and you can use in the um, formatting. Okay, so the other things is here you have to put a quote and around the name for the imported font. Okay, and uh, and besides say loading the font file from say Google service, you can also distribute it together with your website. So for example, just and when you have a web page and you have some pictures, you have to upload the picture file together with your HTML and the CSS so when the people open up the page, they can see the picture. And similarly, you can upload together with your HTML, CSS, pictures, and the font file as well. So when people download it, they will download the font file from your website instead of from Google. Does that make sense? So. They give you a little bit extra security, say so even the Google service is done, the font file will still be available. But that also means you have to maintain this yourself. So you first have to download the font files needed and then add that to your uh, website. Okay, so this is the example. How would you do that? So you have to define a new font in the CSS document and you give it a name and you tell it where you can find the font files. So this is the way you say download from Google if it allows you to do so. And then after that, you can use a font as any other font available in your system. And once you <coughs> include it or create this new font, you can use that as a format. So this gives you the freedom to use lots of different fonts, for example, and this is a web page, and you can see actually using quite a bit of different fonts on it. So this is different from this part. Okay, and uh, this is another useful thing. Actually, you can use the font itself to use it as icons. Okay, there's a certain benefit of doing this. Um, for example, this is a website, you have these things on the side and uh, <coughs> instead of say creating a picture for each of these what he actually used is just one character from a collection of the font so instead of showing a b c and d this font collection have some certain symbols in it so you can just use them um, as an icon for a web page and the, the nice things of this is you can apply all the formatting you can apply and um, you can apply two text to these as well. For example, for text, you can change size, change color, etc., etc. And you can apply to these icons as well. So make it much easier so you don't have to actually edit the picture to change color or size anymore. So that's quite nice to do. Okay, so in this particular example, that's the website providing the font which gives you these icons. And also you can do more complex ones. Um, for example, this is a JavaScript, oh, sorry, it's a jQuery plugin, which is essentially a library, which allows you to this type of font or control all the formatting of the letters. So you can see the letters have different colors and they are not perfectly aligned. So some is slightly higher, some is slightly lower, some is slightly tilted, and you can do these all using this particular library. Okay, and so that's about font formatting. So very quickly, so you could you can load and font files from online, and this will give you much more choices of the font you can use. And the reason doing this is because 
The common set of fonts available on people's computer is very limited. So each person could have a large number of collections on their computer, but the other person that may not share with them, so the one you can safely use in your browser is limited. Okay, and next we can talk about something new in CSS3. So CSS3 is the latest version of the CSS standard, and the, uh, most of these has been implemented on the browsers, so you can use them now. So these things, for example, like rounded corners and drop shadows, and these are the ones you use have to create, say, a picture with rounded corners and put them onto the web page. And now you don't have to do it at all. Okay. So the advantage is much faster because really you just need to change one line of and formatting in your CSS file, and you get these visual effects, and much faster to load. Because previously, for example, if you need a drop shadow, you have to create a, like a picture for a drop shadow and add that to, say, the cells or the divs elements you want to add that to. And it takes longer time to load because it's a picture itself. In this case, all you load is one line of code, which is much smaller than the picture. Let me see. So, okay, so this is examples for rounded corners and uh, so this is like a live demo, so you can set how much rounded the corner, how big it is for all for your four corners. So currently it's set as five pixels, which is quite small, it can be difficult to see. I can change that to 20 and you can see the rounded corner more obviously. I can even make it bigger, say 100, and that might be too big. And you can do much bigger rounded corners. And you can actually use this to generate different shapes you want. So one of the common things people do is actually, you can almost make a circle out of this. So for example, this is also quite a nice shape. And you can actually create a circle out of this using just rounded corners. And this is a trick actually used a lot. And, and when, say, if you see these web pages, you have a picture, which is a person's, say, headshot, but it has rounded background, and you can use this. So if you can set element and set these borders as this circle and put the picture inside, and you, you don't need to, say, cut the picture itself to get a rounded headshot. Does that make sense? Anyway, so that's one of the things you can easily do and change. And similarly, you can have a look of this one, which is drop shadows. And so you can see this is the shadows you get. And there's lots of things you can control. So you can control the angle. It says 45 degrees. Maybe now I want to do maybe say 90. And you can see the shadows is more or less just below it. And you can change how big you want to be. So this is a bigger shadow. If we go back to, and you want to see how blur that it is. So you can see change the blurry. You can change the color of the shadow. So here we're just using say this interactive widget, so you can see how it changes. But when you actually do it, that's the formatting you have to put in there, and the opacity. So basically whether it's transparent or not. Okay, so these are main very useful features, save you quite a bit of work when actually creating the pages, and very relatively easy to use them, because really you just need to know the syntax and set the values, that's all. And uh, okay, this might be outdated a little bit. I think CSS3 is a standard now, or almost a standard. Um, most of the features are supported in all the browsers. <coughs> okay. Okay, so they update the page as well. So basically, these are the different features about the CSS selectors, and they will tell you which one is still working. 
Maybe this is more useful. Okay, so for example, it tells you for this CSS array, these are the features which is supported. And we already see this one, for example, it's called border radius, which is allows you to create rounded corners. Um, the only thing it doesn't quite support yet is this one. And you can see most other things are already supported. So it's fairly safe to use these now. And uh, in some cases, if you really want to support very old browsers, for example, there's lots of companies in my to force all the people in the inside their company using let's say old version of Internet Explorer, which does not support CSS3 features. And if you want to support these type of users, maybe there's a good commercial reason for that, and you have to use something called a progressive refinement. So say to make sure the web page still have the same appearance, for example, the rounded corners, even the web browser does not support it. Okay, so this is one of the example. Um, on the left hand side, you have this browser which supports rounded corners. And on this one is the old version of IE. And even if it does not support the rounded corners, it looks a bit different. But at least it still functions. It does not affect how the how people can use the website. It's just not as nice. Okay, and this is another thing example. Um, on the left hand side, it has these new features from CSS3 called gradient background. So you can see the left hand side and the background color starts with white. It gradually changed to gray at the bottom. And sometimes it's nice to have, whereas this one it does not support, so you look at all gray, <coughs> which is okay. But sometimes it might become an issue, for example, if you meant to be like this, so you put uh, gray headings here, Okay, and when it's not supported, the background will be gray and the heading is gray, then the text will be harder to see and then becomes issue affecting people using the page. Yeah? So there's certain times you have to consider. And there's libraries uh, which allows you to support these old browsers. So for example, if you have this gray yet background, it provides support for all support and old browsers automatically. Um, vendor prefix, we can more or less skip this part now. And uh, this is like the. Have you ever seen these things before in the CSS code? A few years back, they are very common. And because at that time, to use CSS3 features, like the new features in CSS3, each browser used different ways. So you have to specify for different browser how you use that features. So you have to put, say, this is for Chrome, Safari, or any other web kit based browsers as for Mozilla or Firefox, and then follow the by rules. So you would see something like this. So in this example, say I want to use border radius. If it's a Firefox um, browser, and this will be 10 pixels, that's how it's specified. And this is for Chrome and Safari. And this is a general one. So now these ones are almost obsolete. You don't really need to. All you really need is just use the last one, say border radius 10 pixels, and it will work on all browsers. Um, okay. So this is a demonstrator of different features on CSS3, similar to the one we saw before. Uh, you can have different features. Uh, okay, it actually generates the code for you as well, and similar to the one before. So, OK, 
Yeah, yeah so. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay, so what it does is actually, um, again, this is when you need to use these prefix for browsers, and if you set something, it will automatically generate the formatting for each different browser below, and you can just copy paste to your browser, sorry, to your code, which is not really that needed now. Okay, and so this is one of the features we already saw before, and to specify rounded corners, the property on this formatting property is called border radius. You can use one value, which is give the same value for all four corners, and you say top left, so it's only the top left is get formatted, and you can say using something like this to for change it in circle by setting the radius as half the length. Okay, and to do the text shadow, and this is what you need. The keyword is called text shadow, and this is what it looks like. <coughs> As I think it's big enough, you can see. And the one on top has fairly subtle and text shadows, and the one below has much stronger shadow, sorry, more obvious text shadows. And um, while it looks fancy, but it's not always good, sometimes actually it may affect the readability of your text. And also the other things useful is you can always see the formatting, the CSS formatting of uh, a web page and in the developer tools as well. So let me get this down a little bit. So we already seen before, say, we can see the HTML code uh, on the left panel here, but you can see all the formatting on the right hand side. Say, so let's select this element. So we select the first line of text. Uh, where did the mouse go? And you can see this has got selected. And these are all the formatting applied to that particularly H1 heading. And you can see, okay, that's a line of the text shadow. And you can easily turn it on or off. And you can see the results on the page immediately. You can even change the values. For example, I can change the color of the shadow. And you can see the shadow changed immediately. So much easier for you to, say, tweak your design. Similarly, if I select this one, I can see all my settings here, not just the text shadow, obviously, that's the text shadow, but also, say, the font family. I can remove the font family formatting and how it looks like. So that's more or less like the default formatting, if you don't have a particular font, and etc, etc. So this panel on the right is very useful when you're writing your CSS code to try to improve your design. Okay, um, in terms of text shadows, and there's different settings. You can say how far away it is from the actual box, and is it rounded, the color, the transparency, which we just saw before. So these are different effects you can have. Okay. Um, and these things are fairly easy, and really, when you use it, you need to check the reference or a few examples. We should be able to do that. Um, okay, so next one is box shadow, and it's very e similar to text shadow, except applied to text. It applies to a div, which is usually a box, or any other block elements. So these are different possible effects you can have and you can change color on the two sides or multiple sizes. Again, if you just follow these examples, it will be fine. Okay, and you can have multiple background image as well. So, so sometimes, and you can actually want to have multiple 
background images in, instead of putting everything in one single image. Then, for example, you can use CSS, or oh, sorry, use JavaScript to change the formatting. Then you can see the effects of having different background. And we can have a look of this particular page. And okay, and you can see now I select this particular div elements, and in my CSS panel you can see the background image as including a few different ones. So there's one for UFO, one for the stars. There's another stars and one for the skies. And of course, if I take this off, there will be no. And if I could edit this, okay, um, I could take out the first one, and you can see, okay, the UFO is gone, and it changes, and not quite the way we want it. And actually, later on, you can change this using your code to achieve different effects. Okay, and uh, that's the code. I'm not going to go through the details now. Okay, and we saw this an example before as well. You we can create gradient background. As I mentioned previously, you have to create a picture and set it as the background of your elements or page. Now you can just by writing some simple code. And also the other thing that's very nice about this is you can always resize the element and the gradient will change with it. And with the picture, it's not always possible. And there's many different ways of creating. So these are the many different ways you can set in the gradient. You can say, and fading from say top to bottom, bottom to top, from corners. So even say, for example, this one from middle, etc. Okay, different options. Uh, next one would be the opacity. And um, basically, that's like the transparency level, and the less opaque, less opaque an element, and then it's fader. Maybe this is not the best example, but let's give it a try. Uh, where is the opacity settings? No, uh, this is probably the one without. Hmm. Uh, okay, so this is the one with the opacity settings. Um, I selected this as div. And you can see here we have the opacity setting, which is currently set as 0 0.5, which is like halfway, 50%. And if you turn it off, you can see the opacity effects. <laughs> and we can change that to a higher value, so it's closer to being completely opaque. Or change that to a smaller value. So much more transparent. And if you change that to zero, and that means not visible, complete transparent. So that could be one way you can actually hide your element from a page. But it's not recommended to use this and for that purpose. Okay, so that's all we have in terms of the advanced features in CSS3. And uh, 